Good morning. Good morning, and thank you, Nelva and Dong Sok, for that beautiful prelude on this Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers in our congregation and to all the women of our church, as we like to think of all the women as having a role in raising the next generation in the faith. And so, again, happy Mother's Day. Um, I wanted to let you know that in the inside of each uh, aisle there, that what we call the friendship pad is back. We had left it out for the COVID season and, uh, and so on, but it's back. And so you can please register your attendance with us, especially any visitors, uh, if you'd register uh, and give us some contact information so we can tell you more about our wonderful church family. Some of you that live in the neighborhood, we've been uh, without uh, Wi-Fi and the internet already today. The pole got taken out across the road there, but hopefully they'll Hopefully no one was hurt and they'll have that restored uh, shortly and they've assured us that the power is probably not going to go out as they work on that throughout the day. We were hoping that would be the case. Well, I invite you to take your bulletin and be prepared to join with me in the call to worship. Please stand as you hear the sound of our beautiful bells. In the east and west, the north and south, from all corners of the globe, in our homes and our hearts, in this church and in the world, let us worship God.
beautiful, joyful Easter hymn. Let us together pause to acknowledge our need for God's grace in our lives as we pray our prayer of confession, both in unison to share our collective guilt and sin, and then pause for a moment to acknowledge our private need for God's forgiveness. Let us pray together. Master, Savior, Shepherd, Messiah, we know you by many names, Lord. Your presence fills our lives. All that we are and all that we have comes from you. All that you do declares your love for us. Yet when trouble comes, when adversity plagues us, we wonder where you are. How quickly we forget that you are always with us. Dispel our gloom and despair. Change our garments of darkness into robes of dazzling light. Spread your table before us and feed us from your hand. Lead us in the paths of righteousness, for it is in your name that we pray. Amen. Friends, as we lift our heads from this moment of prayer, we do so with confidence for that hymn we just sang, quotes scripture in the third verse, lives again our glorious King, where, O oh, death, is now your sting. Jesus died our souls to save, where your victory, O oh, grave. Friends, because of Easter, I can declare to all of us, we are indeed forgiven of all our sin. Amen. Peace of Christ be with you. Good morning. Um, so a minute for music. Um, uh, I wanted to share with you that uh, Session has approved a music search committee. Um, and I'd love you to know the names of those folks. Uh, Cynthia Kusouris, Phyllis Dale, Michael Grork, Tim Clem, and myself and Dale, um, are, uh, we, we've written a job description and it was posted this week. So um, we're hopeful that we will get some wonderful resumes rolling in in the next few weeks. Um, we have sent it to the AGO, which is the American Guild of Organists, um, the Westchester chapter, the New York chapter, the Putnam chapter, um, we've sent it to Presbyterian Musicians Association, Yale School of Music, um, Juilliard, Manhattan School of Music. Um, I have sent it individually to a number of people uh, that I know uh, through my musical career. So um, we're hoping that we have good news to share with you in the coming months. Thank you so much. Nelva and committee, I think they're all here today. Uh, so if you have a question or a suggestion, you can contact one of those committee members. And do send it on to others. It's on the website, so if you want to just click on our website, the, the job posting is there, and you can click on it, forward it to someone that you know might be a, a musician that would know someone who might be interested. In the meantime, thank you, Dong Sok Shin, uh, for your wonderful uh, gifts that you have shared with us over the last few months and for a few more weeks. Thank you so much. We've also sent it to the Presbytery of Hudson River and Presbytery of New York City and any place we can think of. So if you think of somewhere we should be sending it to, you let us know. Prayer, I want to think of the women, or for families for whom Mother's Day is a difficult day. It's not always a day of celebration. It can be a difficult day as well. 
Pray for the people of Ukraine, and it's been such a tragedy for especially women and mothers and their children as they are fleeing for safety. Let us pray together, and we will conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father and our Eternal Mother, we give you thanks this day for all your many blessings. We are grateful for the beauty of your creation, for the love of friends and family, and especially the love of mothers and all the godly women in our lives. We all the, honor all the women who have raised children and those who are actively raising the next generation. We ask your blessing on them as they wear so many hats as cooks, caregivers, educators, and taxi drivers, and so much more. May we as a community support the families in our midst as we come together to raise and nurture them in their faith. We pray for those for whom Mother's Day is a difficult day, for those who have recently lost a mother or lost a child or have been unable to bear a child. We ask a special blessing and touch of healing and comfort for them. We also pray for all those who suffer this day, from those in hospital to the women and children of Ukraine and Syria and Afghanistan and all the troubled places of our world. May we build together a world that is a safe place for all, especially for the most vulnerable. We pray these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. Today's first reading is from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me aside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries or false witnesses have risen against me. They are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall still, I shall see, wait. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a page. Um, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely a goodness and mercy shall follow me in all, all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Uh, this is the word of the Lord. Our New Testament reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 36 through 43. You've heard us talk about the lectionary, a calendar of readings for the church throughout the year. And in the Easter season, the weeks following Easter, the weeks that take us from Easter to Pentecost, the tradition is that the Old Testament reading, which would typically be from Genesis or Exodus or somewhere in the Old Testament, those readings come from the book of Acts. Uh, and so we have Acts chapter 9, verses 36 through 43. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time, she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with the request, please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. 
Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, as we've said already, and Charlie said once more, Happy Mother's Day. This is one of those holidays that presents a challenge for the church. Christmas and Easter are easy because they are holidays of the church, even if they have been commercialized with Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. But Mother's Day is uniquely challenging because it is not part of the church calendar. It is an invention of our secular culture and it is promoted by the greeting card, chocolate, flower, restaurant, and jewelry industries. It is also problematic because Mother's Day is not a happy day for all families. Some families may have recently lost a mother or even more tragic, lost a child. I always think of my sister on Mother's Day as she lost a toddler who was not even three years old. But even with all the complications, Mother's Day is too important to pass up even in the church. Our theology and our worship is so dominated by male imagery and language that it is an opportunity to lift up the feminine and maternal part of God's nature. It also provides us a chance to reflect on the gifts of women in Scripture and in our own lives, those who have encouraged us on our faith journey. And it is rather ironic, I must say, that on this Mother's Day, our headlines are dominated by the Supreme Court's potential decision on an issue that affects women exclusively. I do all my computer work on my iPad, and the New York Times drops headlines onto my screen of breaking news throughout the day. You probably have that too. Usually I can glance at it and decide whether I want to read it now or later. And one night last week, I was working on something when the headline dropped down about the Supreme Court leak, which projected that it would likely reverse Roe versus Wade. It felt like a gut punch. I thought, just what we need right now, something else to divide this country even more along red state, blue state lines. But more than that, it is an issue that can divide families and even churches. So this week at our session meeting, I told the elders that I wanted to share a few thoughts about reproductive rights and responsibilities as part of today's message. I don't want to dwell on it or go into a theological detail, but I want to set a tone for us as a family of faith. So that if and when this issue becomes the dominant topic in the media and, of course, in the upcoming election cycle, I want us to create a safe space here for people to come to their own conclusions and to be respected no matter what. Our bottom line is we will not let this issue divide us like it is dividing the country. I'm grateful to be a part of our Presbyterian Church that has thoughtfully wrestled with the biblical and theological perspectives on when life begins and the morality of the choices a woman might face. The General Assembly has appointed task forces and study groups to debate, reflect, and report back several times from 1983 to 2012. And I will make links to those studies and statements available in an upcoming email. But there are two overriding principles that I want to share with you today that come from the historic principles of our church government. In our Constitution, our Book of Order, we declare that God alone is Lord of the conscience, and secondly, that we are to show mutual forbearance to one another. In other words, people of good faith can come to different conclusions on deeply personal matters, and we will respect one another, and we will respect and support the women in our midst, no matter what decision they may make about a problem pregnancy. 
This is a safe place for everyone. So on this Mother's Day, let us affirm that this is a safe place for women. Our scripture readings today are all about the safe place that God provides for each one of us. The 23rd Psalm is full of imagery of safety and comfort and security. It begins with the image of us as sheep in a pasture with the Lord as our shepherd. Even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we are not alone, for God is with us. Even when enemies threaten us, God takes care of us and feeds us. And finally, in the end, God welcomes us home. The journey of life proceeds from being a sheep in God's pasture to being a guest in God's house, where we will dwell forever. Talk about a safe place. It's no wonder the 23rd Psalm is one of the most treasured passages in all of Scripture. It's almost always the part, uh, part of the readings that we share at the graveside as we lay to rest one of the saints. And I remind the mourners gathered that these words and images have provided a safe place and given comfort to people of faith for 3,000 years. Just think about it. The story we read from the Acts of the Apostles is also about a safe place. It is a story about mourning that turns into joy, like the psalm that we read last Sunday that had the verse, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. In fact, some translations of that psalm are deliberate in making it a play on words, at least in English. Mourning, M-O-U-R-N, is turned into mourning, M-O-R-N. Acts is a story about a woman, Tabitha, who had her Easter moment and was brought back from the dead. But it is also a story about women and the unique role they play in family, faith, and culture. The story tells us quite a bit about this woman, Tabitha. We know more about her than most of the 12 men who are named as apostles in the Gospels. And here in Acts, it is clear that she is also a disciple. The passage opens in Joppa, which is modern-day Tel Aviv, where Acts says there was a disciple whose name in Hebrew was Tabitha and in Greek, Dorcas. In both languages, her name means gazelle. What a lovely name. It's interesting to speculate on why she was named after such a sleek and swift animal. But we are told that she's a special person. We are given a mini obituary or eulogy about Tabitha. Acts says she was devoted to good works and acts of charity. And later we learn that she made tunics and other clothing for people in need. We are told quite a bit about her character, but we do not know whether she was young or old, married or single, or if she was a mother. It's as though she is symbolic of women in the early church community. She was devoted to good works. She cared about others, and she was loved by the community. This story is about her and her gifts, but this story is also about the other women, the widows, who loved Tabitha and were in mourning for her. It describes the unique way women were the guardians of life and death then and in many ways still are today. We are told that they took Tabitha's body and gave it a ritual washing, much like the tahara which some Jewish groups still perform at death. Then we are told about the widows who were weeping for Tabitha. They may have just been her friends, but they could have been the official mourners of the community. In many cultures, still today, there are women who are professional mourners. They are called to come and weep and wail in an expression of outward grief for the deceased. And these mourners are almost ex always exclusively women. This story is a powerful reminder of the role of women in the community, and especially in the community of faith. Women are the guardians of life and death. They are called to assist when a woman is about to give birth, and women are called to care for the sick, the dying, and the dead. It seems women are entrusted with some of the most sacred moments and rituals of life in the family, in the community, and in our faith. 
Even today, with all our gender equality, women are the ones who give birth, obviously, and who still do most of the child care and who are most often the ones who care for the elderly, the sick, and the dying. And before you get upset with me for stereotyping, I know there are exceptions. There are men who are nurturing in every way of babies, of the sick, and the elderly, but the numbers are overwhelming. Women are the bearers of life's sacred moments. In March and April, we had the funerals for Lil and Bill Sargis, six weeks apart. At both funerals, there were two women of color who came to show their respects to the families. And I recognized them as the home health care workers who had cared for both Lil and Bill in the last months of their lives. I've met some wonderful men who do that special work, but again, overwhelmingly, it is women who take on that special and sacred task. And they do it with love and grace far beyond the often meager pay that they receive. I'm sharing all this background stuff, but you may be wondering why I haven't even mentioned the most important part of the story, the fact that Tabitha came back to life. Well, I have two reasons for that oversight. First, I was drawn to the important role women play in this story as, as a reminder of the importance of women in our lives, in our society, and in our church. On Mother's Day, it is a gift to have a Bible story with such powerful examples of the gifts women share with us all. But secondly, we should know by now that resurrection is the norm for disciples of Jesus Christ. We should not be shocked or overwhelmed by someone who was dead coming back to life. We have seen many re examples of resurrection already in Scripture. Jesus' resurrection was obviously the most dramatic example, but it was not the first. There was Lazarus and Jairus' daughter, and it won't be the last. There's Tabitha and Eutychus. In fact, resurrection is not just for the select few. It is something we will all experience. Tabitha was brought back to life so that she could continue her ministry of good works and acts of charity. But at some point, even her resurrected body gave out, and she died physically, and then she experienced the true resurrection to eternal life, which is the resurrection that you and I will experience when our time on earth is done, when the mourners are called to weep for us. As you reflect on this story, I invite you to think about the women in your life who have nurtured you, cared for you when you were sick, who comforted you when you were grieving, who encouraged you to become all that God intended you to be. Where would we be without the women in our lives? In many cases, the most important woman in our life was our mother, but there are many other women who have made a difference for you. I know my life has been blessed with many women of faith. On this Mother's Day, may we commit to more than giving that special woman in our lives some flowers and a card. May we commit to respecting the role of women in our lives, our society, and our church throughout the year. Let us commit to supporting women who face domestic abuse. Let us commit to equal pay for equal work. Let us encourage and support women in roles of leadership in church and community and government. Let us respect and support women as they are the only ones who can make choices about childbirth. Let us all share the responsibility to care for the aged, even as we show appreciation for the role women play as God's agents of love, nurture, and compassion at every stage of life. Happy Mother's Day to all the women who are here today and to all the special women in our lives. May we all work together to make our church, our community, and our nation a safe place for women and for us all. In closing, often preachers will end the sermon in the name of the Trinity. And so today I would like to follow that tradition with the unique Trinitarian formula that comes to us from Riverside Church in New York City. And so we share these words and these reflections in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all. Amen.
I've been richly blessed in my life with wonderful women. Uh, my mother, I honor her memory, and a woman of faith and love. And the woman I married, the mother of my children, I'm so richly blessed with loving women in my life. And I wanted to start to think of all the women in our church I could name that have been such wonderful examples to me, women uh, of faith who are such a wonderful part of our church. And I thought, oh boy, I'll be here all day if I started naming <laughs> the women of our church. But I'm going to name one. And that's uh, Nelva Tabrock. She's Mother of the Year in our church because <laughs> we will soon welcome Martin and Annie into our church and their two children and Maria and John and their two children, uh, their daughter, are part of our church family. So folks, you, you got some competition here. You got to bring your children and your grandchildren. And at least that's one way to grow our church. <laughs> God bless you, Nelva, and all the women of our church, especially our mothers. We thank you so much. If there's a special woman in your life, reach out to her today. Uh, think of her. If she's living, uh, reach out to her in some special way. And if uh, she has passed into eternity, thank God for her memory. Let's go from this place with this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.